Hello, Michael. I'm currently in between projects waiting for my next gig, but having this serious looming dread of, oh my God, what the F am I doing? What's going to happen next if nothing ever happens? Any advice for dealing with stress in between knowing when your next gig is coming up? Actually, I do have some advice. So I've worked pretty much steadily for 27 years, right? But there was a period in my career where the phone, like halfway in between, where the phone was not ringing, I couldn't get a job. I couldn't get a job on a bad show, much less a good show. Me and my partner, we're freaking out. Like, what happened? Why can't we get work? You know, what's going on here? And I became upset, bitter, difficult to be around, worried, nervous. There was a cloud over my head. I was awful, right? At the same time, I was uh, in a, a private Facebook group for Italian expats living in Los Angeles because I was studying Italian. I was like, okay, I'll, I'm a lurker. I'll just be a lurker in here. And when people say something, I'd write down how they'd say it. And that's how I would learn. One day, this guy asked a question. And this guy's got a, he's got like a douchey profile picture. I'm like, I don't like this guy, right? Already, I don't like him. But he wants to know if, uh, if anybody knows of a good uh, um, accountant who specializes in entertainment industry. I'm like, yeah, I got a guy. So I write him back, yeah, I got a guy because I'm, I'm helping my accountant, I'm helping him. Who cares if he's got a douchey profile picture? Turns out the guy was actually very sweet. We started chatting and he was a pretty successful screenwriter in Italy, he worked a lot, but the work dried up and now he moved to Hollywood to make it in Hollywood. And I'm like, man, I thought I had it hard. This guy's got it way harder because, you know, new culture, new language, no friends, no family, and he's starting from scratch. Like, that's way worse than I got. So we start hanging out, and I'm helping him. And I'm basically sharing all the knowledge that I share with you guys every day, just telling him how the industry works. And he was so grateful. He was so grateful that the more I helped him, the more I wanted to help him. And the cloud over me started lifting, honestly. It was like, oh, okay, I, I don't have it so bad. I'm, I'm, I'm being useful. I'm being of service. Things are getting easier on me. So the, the deal was we started hanging out a lot. He's a wonderful guy. We became really good friends, but we were only speaking in Italian. And, uh, and I had a list on my phone of like, his name was David Bellini. And I had a list of vocab words. And every time he'd say something, I'd write it down. And then the next day I'd parrot it back to him. He wouldn't know, but I was, you know, using, I was learning from him. So one day we're hanging out. My phone calls, my phone rings. It's my agent. At this point, you jump on, the, you don't, you know, you always take that call from the agent. They're impossible to get on the phone. So Mr. Hollywood takes his, excuse me, my agent's calling. And I talk to my agent. Turns out we get an offer to run the show Marin, which way better than any of these horrible jobs that I couldn't get. Thank God for Marin. And, you know, we did that for four years and now we're back in. We're back in Hollywood. We're working again and we're well respected because it's a good show. And I get off the phone with my agent. I go back to talking to, to, to David and he's looking at me. Like, like, uh, like he's never seen me before. I'm like, what? My kick goes up, right? Italian. He says, when you speak in English, you you sound so different. You are a completely different person. And I start laughing. I'm like, yeah, that's because when I speak in Italian, I sound exactly like you because I'm learning from you. I'm you, basically. Right? We're laughing about that. Anyway, it was a couple, maybe a couple of months later or something like that. No, it was maybe, actually probably a year, maybe a year or so later. I was running um, a mixing session for Marin. And I call, uh, you know, I, I send an email to David. I said, listen, why don't you come to this mixing session? They're always fun to sit at a mixing session. We'll hang out and, you know, have fun. And he's like, great, thank you. And then the morning of, I get an email from him. He said, he said you know, ho mal di testa. Penso di non andare. He, he says, I have a headache. I'm thinking of not going. I'm like, really? That's kind of lame. All right, fine. Ci vediamo la prossima. We'll see each other next time. Not a big deal. Well, there wouldn't be a next time. About a week later, I get an email from his wife. He is in the hospital. He has uh, a tumor in his brain. It's got to come out. I've raced down to Orange County. That's where the hospital was. Well, oh, my God, right? They transfer him to City of Hope, which is closer to my house. And every week, after, you know, once a week for the next several months, I'm, I'm visiting him in the hospital. I'm bringing food every time. You know, he, he doesn't look the same at all. He's, you know, he's, he's got the chemo, he's got uh, steroids that made his face giant, you know, and uh, his parents flew in from Italy. They didn't speak uh, English, so I'd, I'd translate, you know, when the doctors and nurses came, I'd tell them what was going on. And every time I came to visit, he's slipping away. He's becoming somebody completely different. I asked, I was like, is this because of the, the, the cancer in his brain or is it the chemo? Because it's something called chemo brain where it changes your personality. You become completely different. His mother said to me, David, non è ancora David. 
you know, David is no longer David. You know, it was, it was heartbreaking. It was horrible. The last time I saw him, he was in a wheelchair, almost unrecognizable at this point. It was only six months later at this point. And he takes my hand and he says, Michael, thank you for everything. I say, no, thank you. Thank you for everything. And I meant it. You know, I thank, thank him because he had changed me. Thank, you know, helping him change me. It, it really helped me a lot. Uh, <clears throat> when he died, I planted a, um, a tree. I, planted, I, got a, I got a picture here. I'll show you. I planted a tree in my front lawn for him. So here it is, in memoria. And um, every fall, you know, I, I love... One thing I miss about the East Coast is that I don't get foliage in, in L.A. I really miss the foliage. So every fall, this is a maple tree and, it, and uh, the leaves change colors. And I send a photo to his mom and his dad. I say, your son's putting on a show, which is what he wanted to do, right? Every fall, he puts on a show. I was in Italy over the summer in Firenze and, uh, and I called his parents. There they are. And we went out to lunch. And it was lovely. And, um, you know, his parents got a chance to uh, talk to someone who sounded exactly like their son. This story will not be in my forthcoming collection. I have a collection called The Paper Orchestra. This story is not going to be in it, but it'll be in the next collection where I really go into it, uh, where I talk about it. And uh, it's a lovely story. And I continue to help people once a month. I have a uh, free webinar on screenwriting. The link is in my profile. I'll see you there.